what a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, it is wonderful to see such a full room of um, individuals who are um, excited about this topic and want to engage in this discussion with us. Um, I am thrilled to be here with my panelists. And um, a huge thank you to Church Hill Club um, for hosting us. And a huge thank you to Lenovo for sponsoring us this evening and, and giving us this opportunity to have this really important conversation. Um, as you know, this is the um, 30th anniversary of um, the ADA, and um, while that a really important legislation has um, opened up accessibility and opportunity for many, we know there's a lot to be done still. And so that's what we want to talk about here today, um, and really talk about what's next and what can we all in this room do to continue to further um, inclusion for individuals with disabilities. So before we jump into a really fantastic conversation, I do want to give each of our panelists just a couple of minutes to introduce themselves and talk about you know, why this conversation is important to them. So Paul, we'll go ahead and start with you. So first of all, I, am, I want to say on behalf of Lenovo and YYR CEO and the 57,000 uh, members of the Lenovo team, I want to say uh, it's fantastic to be here. I've uh, been in a number of events with, with Haben, and we've been having a good conversation all around the world about uh, the importance of you know, diversity and inclusion, um, and tonight specifically about disabilities, and the impact that we all have um, as member of, members of you know, the, the various ranges of our industries to uh, really make the change that we want to see. And, and it is really, really important for us to do that. And that's ensuring that we're not thinking about, you know, diversity as the afterthought, um, but truly be, uh, enabling it to be a part of the DNA within our culture so we actually um, ensure that we are building the right tools, the right technologies for everybody. And when we say everybody, no matter what business, what organization, what individual, no matter where you are, that we're actually delivering the right capabilities uh, to enable you to you know, achieve your potential and promise. Um, I am the Chief Digital Officer for Lenovo, which basically means uh, I help, help in the leadership of our digital transformation across um, all areas, which includes what our business model should be, um, how we better engage with our customers and partners to have a, a true contextual conversation, how we start thinking about the empowerment of our employees right through to our, our digital foundation. So the plumbing, right? And, and it's uh, been a fun journey with Lenovo so far. Fantastic, thank you. Haben, over to you. My name is Haben Grima. I am from the Bay Area, born and raised in Oakland. And the amazing thing about the Bay Area is it's the heart of the disability rights movement. So from day one, I had access to more accessible technology, and Braille and qualified teachers, which allowed me to do well in school, go to college, law school, and join the workforce. The, there were many barriers, and there's more to the journey than that. But it's really special to be here in the Bay Area, where a lot of this started, from technology to disability rights. And it's uh, exciting to be celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act which helped spark a lot of the changes we have now. Fantastic. And Crosby. Good evening, everyone. My name is Crosby Cromwell. I'm one of the co-founders of a social impact firm called Flexibility, Flexibility with an A. Um, we are an employment inclusion firm that looks at both disability from placing people in jobs as well as consulting and training with companies wherever you are on your disability journey. I come from a background in the nonprofit and corporate space. I spent seven years with Walmart building their first national disability platform that had both internal and external components. So flexibility really is the, the fruition of a dream, an accidental entrepreneur sitting here on the stage. Um, and we're excited to be a part of, of the discussion. We were described as a rebel with a strategy. So I'm <laughs> someone who steps in the world with anxiety disorder and feel like I'm, I'm just thrilled that you all took the time to come at the end of the day to hear about this topic and to, to talk with us. Fantastic, thanks for sharing, Crosby. And I am Melissa Engelstad. I am from Accenture. 
Um, I lead inclusion and diversity here for our West Market unit. Um, I've been at Accenture in the private sector here for about 14 years. Um, prior to Accenture, I was actually in the nonprofit space, um, working more in the child welfare system, um, but have had a really incredible experience the last 14 years at Accenture and, and feel very lucky and fortunate that I work for a company where inclusion and diversity is such a key priority. Um, so I've, I've been able to see where we've had opportunities to lead and, and we still have lots of opportunities to continue to grow. So that's why I'm really excited about this conversation today. Um, and for me personally, this is a, a space that's near and dear to me. Um, I grew up sort of watching um, advocacy in action, I like to call it. Um, I have two cousins with disabilities. Um, one is deaf and one has a very rare um, genetic syndrome. And I watched my aunt sort of advocate her pre-ADA days um, and, and really advocate for them to be in a mainstream school system. And then if you fast forward until about 15, 16 years ago, um, I learned, I became an advocate very quickly when my daughter was born with a disability. And so it's something that's really near and dear um, and important to me. And as I watch her grow and finish her high school career here shortly, um, the things we're talking about today are gonna really be, you know, hitting home for us personally as well. So um, it certainly has a personal connection to me and my family. So with that, I'd love to jump into the conversation. Um, and Haben, we're gonna start with you, if that's okay. Um, so first, congratulations on your book. It was really tremendous. I was telling somebody in the audience that it's a, it's a Saturday read. You're never gonna put it down. <laughs> um, so you're only gonna need one day to read it. But it was really fantastic. And I thought you did a really great job um, illuminating your journey and your stories um, about where you were included and excluded growing up. Um, so thank you, first of all, for just sharing so candidly. Um, we've clearly done a lot. We've, we've made a lot of progress, and, and your journey and your story highlighted some of those areas. We've made some progress in technology that's um, opened up some inclusion for folks with disabilities. But I'd love your perspective on, you know, a couple of things just top of mind that you think we could be doing better immediately to really support inclusion of individuals with disabilities? One of the biggest barriers for people with disabilities is assumptions that we're incompetent. Mm -hmm. We have many talents. Mm -hmm. Many of us non-disabled people also have challenges and it's assumed that people with disabilities only have challenges and no talents. So it's important to teach that every person has challenges and talents. And employers, hiring managers, should be trained to see humans mm -hmm. as having both talents and challenges. I, I did really well in school, in high school, graduated valedictorian. When I got to college, I decided it's time to try to get a job. And one of my friends told me, I know a place where you can get a job, Alaska. <laughs> so I said, okay, and I flew up to Alaska. And he was right, there were lots of jobs in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> it was summer in the tourism industry, lots of job openings. So I applied, they called me in for interviews, and that's when they discovered I have a disability. Mm -hmm. I'm deaf blind, I have limited vision and hearing. I have many, many talents, but they were stuck at my challenges, vision and hearing, mm -hmm. and they could not imagine how I would be able to do jobs like washing dishes mm -hmm. or folding laundry. My parents made me do chores. So unfortunately, I had to learn all of those skills. <laughs> They're tactile skills too. You do not need to be able to see to fold laundry. Right. But employers kept refusing to hire me. Mm -hmm. They saw my resume, all the good grades, glowing recommendations, and they were pulled in when they saw that. But once they saw my disability, they came up with excuses. Oh, we're no longer hiring, we're not interested, not a good culture fit. 
That happens to a lot of people with disabilities. 70% of the blind are unemployed. Many have college degrees, PhDs, but employers assume that we're incompetent. Mm -hmm. Unemployment is double for the disabled compared to the non-disabled. I eventually did find an employer who gave me a chance. She hired me to work the front desk at a small gym in Alaska. And my responsibilities included taking care of the cash register, making sure the machines worked. One day, a woman came to the front desk and said, a treadmill isn't working. I followed her to the treadmill, and I hit the on button. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> I tried the other buttons on the machine. Nothing happened. So I put my cane down, and I felt the machine from top to bottom. <coughs> on the bottom, there was a switch. I flicked the switch, and the machine worked to life. The woman told me, oh my goodness, I didn't see that switch. <laughs> I told her I didn't see it either. <laughs> <laughs> Disabled people have alternative techniques. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those alternative techniques, like touch, are superior to mainstream techniques. If you don't know how a disabled person is gonna do a job, ask, what accommodations will you use? How do you plan to do the job? You'll learn a lot in the process. You'll even find new ways and better ways to complete a task. So one of the things we really need is to educate hiring managers that disabled people also have talents. Everyone has challenges and talents. The other thing we need to do, once we hire people with disabilities, we need to remove barriers in the office. There are lots of barriers in the office, and some of them are, are caused by technology. I'm now encountering barriers that I didn't encounter in the past. For most of my life, I've been able to use elevators. You walk in, read the Braille label, hit the button, exit on your floor. A few years ago, I encountered an elevator that was all touch screens. Mm -hmm. It was not accessible to me. Mm -hmm. And something I used to be able to do independently was taken away by technology. As we build technology, we need to make sure it's accessible to everyone. And as we bring in tech into our offices, coffee machines with text screens, telephones, elevators, we need to make sure to ask, is this accessible? Can we buy the most accessible version to bring into our office so that when we have disabled employees or our employees become disabled later, they can continue to contribute their talents and be part of the team? Excellent. Thank you, Haben. Fantastic perspective. And we're going to dive into a couple of those points you um, mentioned a little bit deeper here as we keep working through our conversation. Um, one of the things I wanted to transition into that you mentioned, Haben, was around, um, around employment and, and getting employment. Um, and Crosby, I'd like to start with you because your organization is doing really fantastic work um, helping individuals with employment. And um, you know the statistics we've talked about, there's over 15 million individuals with, indi with disabilities worldwide, but the research shows that over 10 million of those individuals are able to be employed. And that's a huge amount of skill and talent that all of our businesses can really be tapping into. Um, and, and we have a lot of organizations here in the, in the um, room today and those of us on the stage, and, and we're all committed to being inclusive hires or em employers, right, in our hiring, but we know we're still not getting it right. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear from you as somebody who's working with individuals on the hiring process. What are you seeing as the barriers that we should all be doing better and quickly? Yeah. Um it's such a good question. I think some of the panel tonight will be just like a, a ditto comment. Haben said it so yeah. beautifully yeah. when she articulated it. But if you think about your company and roadblocks that potential candidates or potential employees are facing, think about your company as a wall, a window, or an open door. 
So a wall, there's no entry point, right? A window you can see through, but I can't get in. An open door is bringing me inside your company. And so there's really two things that you can think about in that roadblock process. One is your company's understanding of the full breadth and scope of disability. And it's really broad. It's, it's everything from deaf and blind to anxiety disorder to long-term med medical conditions to mobility disabilities. And understanding the full scope of what that looks like and how you accommodate and how you welcome individuals within the scope of who they are and the authenticity of who they are is going to remove a barrier. It is going to improve your workforce. The other thing to examine are your entry points when you think about candidates, right? So how are you sourcing? Mm -hmm. If your tools for sourcing candidates are not accessible, you're knocking out a whole pool of talent. Is your website accessible? Am I represented in your materials? You're already doing your marketing campaigns. Put an individual with a visible disability mm -hmm. in your marketing campaigns. That says so much about who your company is and what you're trying to do. And those entry points are from A to Z. Hobbins said one of the most important ones, training your hiring managers. They are your front line. And if they don't have an understanding whether that interview happens in person or virtually these days, if they don't have an understanding of disability and it creates a fear in them, the interview is then shut down. Mm -hmm. The possibility and the opportunity is shut down from the outset. So that's such a critical part is training your hiring managers to understand disability, mm -hmm. to take away the fear of it, to have a comfortability with it, to know how to talk about accommodations and self-ID and the right kinds of questions. That's fantastic. That's really great. Um, you know, it reminds me of a, um, an example I've got from Accenture, and one of the things we have realized is that there is a huge untapped potential um, in the autistic community, mm -hmm. um, and with individuals with autism have a lot of um, skill and, and um, strength to bring to our organization, especially a technology type of organization where there's lots of creative thinking. And so we've been able to partner with special um, organizations that help individuals with autism get um, hired. And it's been really fantastic to work with the recruiters because that, you can imagine, is a situation that might not go so well through a traditional recruiting process. And um, making sure that that there's that awareness in advance has really opened up the opportunity to have um, a, a better experience for the candidates coming in and make sure that our recruiters are really being inclusive in their, their hiring as well. Yeah. Great, so Paul, I'm gonna move on to you and, and um, build upon something that Haben talked about also around technology and, and accessibility. And you know, one of the things I've heard you say is that um, you know, new, tech new technology is challenging the status quo and it's democratizing access. But we also heard about how it can create challenges. Sure. Um, and so how are, how's a company like Lenovo sure. um, focused on making sure we're keeping technology accessible? Sure, so, so when you think about our, you know, the, our, our purpose in essence, it's really around how do we bring smarter technology to all? And, and a lot of the time there's been a big emphasis on smarter technology, right? And what we can do with smarter technology. But we've also put a lot of emphasis around the all to ensure that we're really thinking about the entirety of the diverse communities that we have. Look, I've, I've had the privilege of working for some amazing companies and, and to be honest, um, most of them have been extremely diverse, but I've never seen, a, I've never worked for a, a company as diverse as, as, as Lenovo. That really kind of puts its money where its mouth is. Mm -hmm. You know, this is one of the reasons why you know we we uh, are working really closely with Harbin as our you know uh, diversity and inclusion uh, ambassador to really help us think um, about everything that we're doing from the um, inception of a product all the way through to how we bring it to market. Look, there are approximately a billion people on the planet that have some level of the, uh, disability, um, and what what we're looking to do is. How do we go and identify and understand exactly what that is and how do we build the right solutions or sets for them? How do we work with them to ensure that we actually uh, enable or remove friction from their everyday lives, right? And, and that's really, really important. Look, we've, we've all made advances, advancements, I should say, in, you know, uh, in technology, whether it be social, mobile, you know, blockchain, uh, AI, data, et cetera, but yet there's still so much friction left within the system. 
And that friction is really is, at, at Harbin gave a great example of an elevator, right? Mm -hmm. Most people go into these elevators going, this is great, there's an operational efficiency, I press a, a, a button, it tells me what floor I have to go to, and it tells me to go to elevator four, right? And I walk down there and it's so efficient, but yet we're excluding so many people from that experience. Mm -hmm. We're stopping Harbin from being able to leave her hotel room without having to call down and asking for assistance mm -hmm. to bring her down, downstairs. And that is a, that is a problem. That is an afterthought. So how do we t t not just start at the afterthought and really bring it into the core? And, 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 and this is across you know, all areas, as I say, of, of, our, of our diverse uh, 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 environment. Mm -hmm. If you think about just you know, people that have access to the internet, right? You know, uh, African Americans in the US, you know, does 51% don't have access. Mm -hmm. you know, Hispanics, 51% don't have a access, right? If you think of, you know, our middle class where, you know, th of $30,000 um, or less, you'll see that 29% of them don't have a smartphone, right? You'll see that, you know, 54% of them don't have a PC and 64% of them don't have an, a tablet. And why do I say that? It's because if you think about our education, it's all done now through technology, but if we're stopping people from an early age having access to that technology, it has a problem later on, right? For our workforce and what that means. So culturally, what we have to do internally is look back inside and see exactly what we're doing right and be honest with ourselves, what we're not doing so well, and then partner with, um, or even better, hire in the right people to help us. And because all of these you know, people with disability are great customers, but they're great designers, they're great engineers, they're amazing product managers, and they know how to build a product you know, for everybody. And, and that's really what we've been doing in Lenovo. Yeah, that's really fantastic. Um, and you touched on the fact that you have a new partnership with Haben. Yes. So um, Haben, congratulations on your new role um, supporting um, all the great work that Paul and his teams are doing as, as the accessibility and um, inclusion advisor at Lenovo. Um, I'm curious, you know, why was that important for you to take that role? And what are you hoping to see coming out of um, companies like Lenovo creating opportunities like this? Every tech company should have a role focused on disability and accessibility. We're one of the largest markets. There are over a billion people with disabilities around the world. So if an organization is interested in growing, they need to really take this seriously. And Lenovo wants accessibility to be at the heart of the culture. And that's, that's what I'm doing to help create a culture with more access and inclusion where we see people with disabilities of drivers of innovation. Mm -hmm. There are lots of stories of disabled people creating, sparking innovation. A lot of people don't know those stories. Mm -hmm. So we need to get them out into the public. I, I want to share one of my favorite stories with you. It goes way back in history to 1808, mm -hmm. before email, <laughs> before even Braille. And back then, if a blind person wanted to write a letter, they had to dictate it and have someone else write it down for them. There were two friends in Italy, one blind, one sighted. And they could not use this system of dictating their letters. They had to keep their letters secret. They were love letters. They used this as a design challenge. How can we create a way to write? that doesn't require sight. And they built the first working typewriter. With a typewriter, you can memorize the layout of the keys. You don't need to be able to see if you can memorize the layout of the keys and then type a letter and produce a letter. Nowadays, lots of people write letters on keyboards, and some of the fastest typists are touch typists. If we make our teams diverse, increase hiring of people with disabilities, mm -hmm. remove barriers in our offices so that the disabled applicants can thrive and advance in the organization, then we're gonna have more diverse products and services and you could end up building the next big thing. Mm -hmm. 
that benefits the entire community. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that story, Haven. That was really great. Um, Crosby, I'm gonna um, switch over to you for a minute. I've heard you mention before sort of the commonality between the tech industry and disability. Can you share a little bit more about what you're thinking when you say that? Sure. I I get so excited about this conversation and so excited about the relationship between Haven and Lenovo. I just think this is brilliant and best in class. Um, but one of the quotes in Haven's book about one of her challenges, as challenges has been dealing with the stigma of the narrow definition of personhood and the narrow definition of what is normal. And if you think about what the tech industry is so good at doing, what you all are doing, innovating, and what individuals with disabilities have to do every day, it is problem solve and innovate. It's the way that both of those industries and both of those individuals and communities step into the world. So if you think about a person without a disability, if you think about a person not in the tech space, they may see a flat box, right? But what does a person with a disability do who's innovated their entire life? Or what does the tech industry do who's figuring out what our future is, what the next phase of our life will be? They pick it up and they realize it has corners. They realize it's a Rubik's Cube and it can be moved around and shuffled and changed. And I feel like that's what's happening here. It's beautiful and it's the combination of people who see the world differently. And who knows what will come out of these conversations when more tech companies um, clamor and glob onto this, when you start to hire disability into your company, when you start to hire, as Paul said, designers with disabilities, it is changing the way that our future looks, and it's a belief that the future is accessible. So, Excellent. Yeah. Just a, a thank you, and also, Lenovo just became what's called a valuable 500 company. <laughs> if you don't know what the valuable 500 is, look it up. Mm -hmm. It was just presented at Davos. It's a, a woman named Caroline Casey. Currently, I think 245 companies have signed on to be valuable 500. What that, that whole mission is saying, we don't know enough about disability, but we care enough to learn, and we care enough to make it a priority and watch us, you know, watch what's next. So I just want to say thank you to Lenovo for That's good. That's that commitment. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, we're absolutely worth noting. Thank yeah. you. So Paul, from a technology standpoint, you know, we hear all about AI. AI is, mm -hmm. you know, always the buzzword. Um, you know, what is the role of AI as we continue to um, think about accessibility, and what are the risks and sure. and and the sure. positives? So, uh, so if if we, if we think about um, data, first of all, well, let, let's start with this. There is approximately 25 billion. I've, I'm a numbers person. I can probably <laughs> worked out already, right? There's approximately 25 billion connected devices on the planet, right? All of them generating data. Um, my phone is generating data. My wearable is generating data. It's in this room. It's generating data. It's connecting to yours. It's generating more data. There is now 44 zettabytes of data on the planet. Mm. Think of that. Everybody knows how much that is, right? <laughs> it's approximately 100 million printed copies of the Library of Congress, right? And what we're trying to do is now look for patterns within that data. Because if we can identify patterns within that data, we can better predict what's happening, right? We can better predict what our customers might need. We better be able to satisfy our customers and have a more contextually relevant conversation with them. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that that data is not as diverse as it needs to be in order for us to have a true representation and a true understanding, which means that if we don't fix that and have a fully inclusive um, graph of all of that data, the systems will just have the same unbi unbiased consciousness or, or unbi unconscious bias, I should say, as humans do. Right? And we've seen that. We've already seen it. If you read the uh, latest um, research from MI MIT or even the FBI tech expert uh, research, you'll see that you know, um, both disability, um, people of color, and women um, are significantly uh, underrepresented when it comes down to facial recognition. Um, so we can't actually allow for a number of the, a number of the experts are saying, so it's, it's actually against, as I said earlier on, it's stopping people from being mm -hmm. fully inclusive in this digital economy. And, and that's, that's kind of scary when you think about you know, what, what we're trying to do. So for, I'll give you an example. Um, about 12 years ago, myself and a couple of guys put a patent together around, uh, has everybody ever heard of a, uh, 
cashierless store where you can go in oh, and pick yeah. up something and, and then leave. Mm -hmm. So we put that pattern together to do that about 12 years ago. You know, I grew up in Ireland and if you, in Ireland, when I gr was growing up, if you picked something up, put it in your pocket and walked out, that would be called stealing. <laughs> but um, now it's a customer experience. <laughs> but because, <laughs> because of the lack of facial recognition, right, who's having a problem then with it, right? Because all you're meant to be able to do is walk into a store. You don't need a wallet. You don't need your phone. You don't need anything. You just need your face. It recognizes who you are. It allows you to pick up that product and then walk out, and everything is good. Um, but because of facial recognition and the lack of diversity, you'll see the, the people are being impacted or people with disabilities are being impacted by that. People of color are being impacted by that and women are being impacted by that. So what we have to start thinking about is ensuring that all of that data that we are utilizing, that we are enabling, and the machine learning and the deep learning that we're doing on and around that is actually fully inclusive because we're, we're actually starting to see a digital divide happening, mm -hmm. slowly but surely, and if we don't fix it now, it, it just becomes a, a little bit too big for us to handle later on. So again, that's gonna be the afterthought, and what we're trying to uh, get people to really think about is design it from the beginning, from the, you know, the concept of a solution, and ensure that we do it the right way. Excellent. Well, I know the audience is going to have a lot of questions probably around um, technology. And when we open up in a few minutes for um, open q and I, I expect some more. But I do want to shift for our next couple of minutes. We've got about 10 minutes before we'll open up to audience conversation. But um, one of the things I've heard all of the panelists talk about beyond technology and accessibility is culture, right? And the importance that um, the culture within our, our companies plays in making sure that we're creating that inclusive space. And um, uh, Karen mentioned the research that we had done at Accenture um, about a year ago. And you know, we sort of came up with four kind of key areas that was really important for creating that culture um, of inclusion around employ, enable, engage, and empower. And you know, we've spent some time talking about employ, um, and we've talked about enable through, through technology. So I'd really like to talk about um, that pillar of engage and empower and um, how we're doing that. And so I'd love to um, start with, um, with Crosby and, and share your thoughts around you know, either employ or, in, um, or, sorry, empower or engage sure. um, and how you think companies and organizations can do that. Yeah, um, it's a good question. When you think about empower and engage, what we need to do and what we're trying to do really, especially with with flexibility is change the narrative of disability. The narrative di of disability has been historically a medical model or a charitable model, mm -hmm. when it should be one of empowerment, social, um, and justice, right? So it's, it's a shift not only in the activist ad advocate community, but it's a shift that needs to happen inside companies. And how do you do that? How do you shift that narrative? One, use your employee resource group as a focus group, as um, a think tank for how to start to tell your stories within your company and externally, whether that's a blog or whatever you choose to do, especially this is such a, a cool time to think about this as it's the 30th anniversary of the ADA. What can you all be doing on July 26th mm -hmm. as a company that recognizes this landmark year? It's an opportunity, take it take it. And so when you think about changing that narrative, again, like I said, just you know, utilize your employees, I think, is one of the, the strongest things you can do. I mean, at the end of the day, we all need a safe space. Mm -hmm. And if you're creating a safe culture and a safe space within your company, then people with disabilities are going to feel free to ask for accommodations, to disclose, to want to stay, your retention will increase. There's a, a Harvard Business School study that just came out that shows that um, companies that are utilizing disability have a higher retention rate, have lower overhead costs because of the retention rate. I mean, there's a, there's a business case right. behind this. And the business case is just the place to start. Right. It's understanding that it's good for disability and then the human and the social good of this is what it does for your employees on the inside. Yeah, that's fantastic. Paul, what are a couple of examples yeah. um, at Lenovo? Yeah, there's a, there's a number. There's a number. We, we've, we've put together a, from a number of uh, 
you know, executives across Lenovo, we've put together a, uh, a diversity and inclusion board mm -hmm. that really ensures that this, this is, you know, this sits at the, the C-suite, yeah. right? We're really talking about it from, from the top all the way down and ensuring that it's not just talking about it, but how do we actually walk the walk? So the ERGs, I mean, is something that we've put a lot of focus in to make sure that people do feel included no matter where they are, who they are. Um, but, but even more so, we started up the Lenovo Foundation mm -hmm. that's really aimed at STEM and ensuring that we can actually include you know, our, our younger uh, members of our society actually into technology, making sure that they, as well as, as, as much as we can, we can actually provide them with as much technology as, 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 as we possibly can. But as I said, working with Harbin is actually really getting us to think and rethink. Mm -hmm. Is there some other areas that we should be working on or should be doing? Now, Harbin is you know, spending a lot of time not only with our, our executives, but all the way through our organization, mm -hmm. because it is a cultural change. And to be honest, culture eats strategy every day. So as much as we talk about it, unless we really think about it from a cultural perspective, you know, it doesn't go anywhere. And I think we got to really walk the walk there too, right? Yeah, that's fantastic. I love what you said, Paul, around um, you know, sort of starting at the top, right? And I think that's something we've really seen at Accenture. We've, we've got a, our leaders at the very top. This has to be an area of priority and passion um, if you're going to create the space that feels safe for the rest of your employees. And, and that's something we've really seen. I, you know, Julie Sweet is our, our CEO globally, and um, she's incredibly committed to our people in every way, shape, and form. And, um, and just inclusion and diversity has been her passion since she started. But it's really changed the narrative for us at Accenture. And, and that was such a great example. Like I said, I've been focused on this for 14 years at Accenture. And Julie came in about four, four and a half years ago. Um, and the narrative just changed immediately, right, with her. And, and you've seen the trickle down with the culture um, and creating that safe space. And I was, I was sharing with Crosby yesterday, one of my favorite things we do with our ERG is around um, a series we call Walk in Your Shoes. And it's, um, we've created enough of a safe space for our disability ERG, for individuals want to share their story. They, they're raising their hand. We have the, you know, a, the schedule's full for the next year of individuals who are raising their hand and want to join this webinar and share their story and talk about their disability, but also talk about what they're contributing to our business, right. right? Because it's not just about their disability, it's about their role and what they're doing every day. And it has been a tremendously successful um, series, but just a neat opportunity to open up the dialogue, and I'm tremendously proud of it. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, Haben, you've heard a little bit about um, what some of us are doing in our companies around um, empowering um, our, our persons with disabilities. Um, what else should we be doing from your perspective? We've talked about culture. Mm -hmm. Investing in accessibility is an excellent decision. Lots of good business reasons to change your culture so that you're investing in accessibility. Mm -hmm. And if stubborn people are still not convinced, mm -hmm. there are legal requirements. <laughs> <laughs> it's much, Sounds much longer. easier to choose to change your culture, to create safe spaces mm -hmm. for employees, to have leaders in the company say and do the work of making the organization more accessible than having to deal with litigation, which is expensive and time consuming. I, I had one such experience. When I graduated from Harvard, I worked at a law firm that focused on class action litigation. And I got complaints that a library, a digital library, was not accessible to blind readers. We sent the company script a letter asking them to address the issues and work with us to address the issues. No response. We sent the letter again. No response. Finally, on my 26th birthday, we sued them. <laughs> <laughs> then they responded. <laughs> and they argued that digital places don't have to be accessible under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Some companies have tried to make this argument. I disagree, my team disagreed, and we wrote a brief 
arguing that the ADA, play, that the ADA applies to digital businesses. It doesn't matter if it's a physical store or an online store, it's still subject to the EDA. Mm. And the judge in that case agreed with us and ruled that the EDA applies to digital places. Mm -hmm. And after that, Script reached a settlement agreement with the National Federation of the Blind. They would have saved so much time and money if they just agreed <laughs> from the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so don't do that. <laughs> Invest in accessibility, choose inclusion, yeah. avoid litigation. It's a good tagline. It that is, is. Yeah. that is. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that the rest of us could say, say it any better. So yeah. um, with that, I do want to open it up to Q&A because I know the audience has got to have a lot of great questions um, coming out from this conversation. So I, I believe we have in people running with mics. So please wait for the mic um, and ask your question. I have to stand? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> we would like to see you. Hi. Um, thank you so much for this. This is amazing. And I actually know Crosby, so I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I have a question for Crosby. Um, so I'm a CEO, executive director, and I have been at nine different companies. And we do, I'm Native American. We do a really good job on diversity and inclusion in all the other areas, but not um, I will say I'm not, I don't think we do a good enough job with people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. What I want to know though, pragmatically, how to work with flexibility. So we use executive search firms and they don't bring us candidates. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to say it's not our fault, but it, there is an obstacle yeah. because mm -hmm. we're not seeing those candidates. How do we work with you and, and, and pretend I'm a big tech company, <laughs> not a uh, social impact company. You know, the, the big companies do work. Yeah. There's a pipeline of executive search mm -hmm. firms that are established. Can you work alongside them? Um, I'm wanting to figure out how search firms that specialize in what you do can actually get into the pipeline because I see an access problem for what you do. Yeah. No. Thank you, it's a, it's a good question. You know, at the end of the day, maybe, because this is my passion and my dream, at the end of the day, we put ourselves out of business, right? There is, mm -hmm. there is no conduit, but the reason that the conduit is needed is because we know how to source and find the talent, and we speak the language mm -hmm. of openness of com communication and accessibility, right? So it's building deep partnerships and relationships for the business folks and the corporate folks in the room, you have some organizations that are sitting around you that we work with. So if you think about the Center for Independent Living, which is where, where some of the disability rights in our nation started, mm -hmm. sits right here in the Bay mm -hmm. Area. If you think about what the mayor's office is doing around disability, if you think about what university centers are doing, flexibility builds deep relationships with um, agencies, organizations, universities, as well as knowing how to reach out digitally to individuals with disabilities and, and source that talent. And so what we do from the outset is make sure that they're ready to have the accommodations conversations that they need to have, that they have a comfortability, and we're working with companies who are open and excited and willing to be a part of this journey. So if you think about it as a bridge or a conduit, um, we want to be a part of that conversation. And for me, flexibility, and then I'll stop. For me, <laughs> flexibility is the fruition of a dream in that it is the company that I continued to look for, to find and to fund and to partner with while I was at Walmart mm -hmm. and couldn't find. I was having trouble sourcing the talent and using you know, the favors and the chips you need with, with um, the right folks to start initiatives and we couldn't find the talent. Mm -hmm. And so flexibility is the fruition of it's time and we know how to do it and we're ready to partner with you in a safe way wherever you are on that journey. Thank you, Crosby. Next question. Hi, uh, I'm Jen. Um, I am really grateful for the conversations that have been had tonight. Um, I'm an equity consultant. I work in communities, and I'm newly hired by Flexibility, so this is not a plant. But I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I work with the folks who have the anxieties. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about the techniques that anyone on the panel, but in particular, Hobbin, what you would suggest to decrease the ableist anxieties, because we live in a society that is deeply nervous about non-typical bodies. Mm -hmm. And so it's one thing, and I think it's very important to empower people with disabilities 
what's the counter to decrease the anxiety because that's the wall that I run into when I'm trying to get folks. So I'd love to hear strategies that folks use when we're talking about how do we get that anxiety to decrease so that um, it's a safe space that you're talking about and it's an encouraging space. Leaders often control or, or influence the culture of a space. So one thing we can do is to, to increase messaging from leadership that disability, uh, disability positive messaging. And um, also, uh, so for those who don't know, ableism is discrimination against people with disabilities. It's the assumption that the disabled are inferior to the non-disabled. Ableism is hidden in most of our culture and a lot of people don't notice it. Mm -hmm. And we need to do work to, to train and educate people to notice it. So c c cultural training to help people identify it will help people work to remove it. My book is a series of stories, amusing, uh, sometimes difficult, that teach people all the different ways ableism intersects with, with gender, with race, in school, in the workplace. Conversations like that will help people start to, to recognize it and, and work on it. In most companies, the burden falls on disabled people to do the work to remove barriers. And that gets exhausting. Oftentimes, a disabled person just wants to be a doctor or an engineer and not have to also do the work of educating all their colleagues about ableism. Mm -hmm. Having a designated role in the office for an accessibility person to help identify ableism in the workforce, tech barriers, social barriers, and work to remove it will save your disabled employees a lot of emotional exhaustion and time that could go into their actual mean jobs. Right. So another thing to do is have a role for accessibility and, and create time for training so that person could do the job to educate people. Cosby, do you wanna add? I think that's it. I think that's <laughs> the answer, it's perfect. Excellent, our next question. Hi, I'm Iris, I'm from Mixed Panel. I started our disability ERG, Mixability, just by being literally the first person to sign up for it. <laughs> um, this is about the ADA and ways of enforcing it because we are currently stuck in kind of an awkward situation where we are subleasing office space mm. and there is no way to access one of the floors easily if you're in a wheelchair because there are no ADA door openers installed on the doors from the elevator lobby and we can't afford two receptionists to have that second door staffed and open. The people we're subleasing from have already been having a years long fight with the building to try to get it fixed and the building management won't fix it and we can't afford to sue them and if we go cowboy and try to install them ourselves, we're on the hook for millions of dollars in code upgrades we can't afford. Do you have any advice on how to navigate this situation? <laughs> I'm dreading the day we get an engineering interviewee in a wheelchair and have to have that conversation of, um, well, you kind of can't open the door. It's really heavy. <laughs> yeah. What do we do? Is it to Hobbin or to, to me, to both of us? Any of you, <laughs> anyone who has any ideas. I'll, I'll jump go in ahead. then if Hobbin, yeah, if Hobbin wants to, to go after it. So I'd love to have a offline conversation to kind of understand the depths of it. And this may not be practical at all, but let me start with just a really low, does a door stop? Can a door stop stay in there? But like, I mean, seriously, it's a security like, issue. We don't have anyone it. staffing the door. Okay. So I mean, there are there are real legal outlets mm -hmm. that you should have, and I hear you saying that you don't have the dollars to sue, and that's why I'd want to have an offline conversation. I'm interested to hear what Hobbin says as well. I saw Nicole Bone in the room, who is um, mm -hmm. the mayor's director on disability. I think this is an amazing resource mm -hmm. for you to use to have a conversation about how can the city help in, the, mm -hmm. in this issue? Um, and then just keep forcing, I'm a big believer in a lawyer writing a letter. So, I mean, I just like, I'll, we'll take it offline and talk about next steps. Yeah. 
Abed, do you have any additional thoughts? Absolutely. Uh, for those who don't know, there's a bit of a delay between when someone speaks and when I respond. And I'm actually using some cool tech on here. It's a Braille computer with dots on the bottom. And there's a typist in the front row who's typing the audio content in the room. And I'm reading it in Braille. So that's what I'm doing to access information. When I hear about access barriers in the office, my first desire is to try to fix it peacefully. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes you can do that. Sometimes educating people will help them find a simple solution like a doorstop, communication with the security guard, some kind of solution that'll work. Mm -hmm. But if someone just absolutely refuses to treat people with disabilities with respect and give them access so that they can do their job and work, then you can turn to litigation. And there are nonprofit legal centers that help people with disabilities mm -hmm. at no cost to, to the disabled person. And then there are also structured negotiations where you can avoid going into court and, and sit together and, and come to a solution. Excellent. Where do we have our next question? Hi, thank you so much for being here and thank you for the panelists and sharing your perspectives. Um, I work in uh, accessibility, but I had a question from something Paul brought up and I was wanting um, to see everybody's thoughts on that. Um, I know we're here in San Francisco <coughs> in Silicon Valley, like the hub of tech innovation. Uh, and Paul brought up facial recognition, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because I'm sitting in my chair thinking, oh, but we might not want, I mean, I, I know we're all here about inclusion, but we might not want that because, okay, now the cameras know data about all of us, including data on the disability. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering maybe us as a community can take a step back and maybe be on the forefront for protecting privacy to say like, hey, it doesn't matter like what your facial recognition is. As long as I have a private payment card, I'm a human being, I can walk out with that item. And that I think would benefit everyone and the community and the world as a whole. Then like inclusion in a thing that maybe we shouldn't be, where nobody should be included in the first place. <laughs> So for the scenario of being able to walk out of the store with something, you have to sign up for it, right? Yeah, so <laughs> just, just, I, I don't want people leaving here and then everybody getting arrested. <laughs> yeah. Paul said, try it out, it works. <laughs> so just make sure that you've signed up for yeah. it first. Uh, look, look, you know, when it, when it comes down to payments, not that we're gonna get into payments, but when it comes down to payments, there is, everyone is looking to see how they can you know, enable more digital payments, right? Whether it's on my, whether it's on my mobile device, my, my watch, or whatever the case it is. Um, you're right, we have to be really uh, keyed into what level of data that in, as an individual we wanna share. And, and you know, there are more and more and more rules coming out about that, whether it's GDPR over in the UK or in Europe or whatever. Um, but you gotta, you know, you gotta, your data is yours. You gotta own it. You wanna make sure that it's not an opt out, it's an opt in. Mm -hmm. And so be aware of that and be aware of that of whatever companies that you're interacting with. And I, I can get into as much detail as you want about it, but it's, uh, be aware of it. This is a little bit of a tangent to the question, but when Paul talked about too with AI algorithms and we think about that more and more as it, it, it taking over the hiring process and how important that is to be inclusive and make sure that the bias as much as is possible mm -hmm. is out of the algorithms and that we're talking about this process differently. So if you think about gaps in resumes, I'm old enough to where that was a problem or maybe still is, <laughs> but a, a year gap in a resume could be a person with lupus who was out of the workforce right. for a year or it could be a lot of things where a resume has a reason. Mm -hmm. So not kicking those out because algorithms have built them in yeah. mm -hmm. is a way to ensure that you can have a more inclusive environment. There was a study done by Rutgers where it was facial recognition mm -hmm. and it had recognized both Oprah and Michelle Obama as men. And so that's what we're talking about, the bias that is built into these systems mm -hmm. who don't recognize different races, who don't, right. don't recognize different abilities. And we have to, 
have designers, hopefully designers with disabilities, mm -hmm. building those systems to recognize difference and, and value difference. Yeah, and it, it is important now. I mean, look, look AI has, has many benefits that it can, it can give us, as, as we're all aware, in, in no matter what industry. Um, but we got to recognize that if we don't have a, a true inclusive uh, view of data, mm -hmm. for example, um, we can actually come out with problems later on. And that, that's the same with man, many of the advances that we're making, right? Look, we're moving at a pace that we're clock speed that we have never seen before when it comes down to the, all of these innovation, all of this, the innovation and, and the, the pace in which we're doing it. And we got to make sure that we're really thinking of it end to end mm -hmm. um, because uh, again, we, we can run into uh, problems that we really, really don't want to. Excellent. Where's our next question? Hi, my name is Karen Park. Um, I'm a mother to three beautiful boys, including one who has very complex disabilities. And 30 or 40 years ago, he would have been the kind of kid that, that, that the school district would have put into a segregated classroom. Um, so when I think about his future and what he'll, his life will be like as an adult, these types of conversations are so important to me because I can't imagine anything more wonderful than to him to have the same opportunities as everybody else and to have a, a career and a purpose and to be able to be productive. Um, so, Hob and I want to thank you in particular. You're an incredible role model and I uh, want to thank you for all you've done. Um, I wanted to ask a question to you, Hobbin, because um, I have found as I've worked with the school districts uh, for my son that understanding the IDEA, I'm not an attorney and I hate reading legal documents, but understanding the IDEA mm -hmm. can be really, really helpful, even just being, being able to specifically drop a specific quote from the legislation can be very effective in getting the districts to act. Um, so when we think about the workplace, for those of us who are not in HR, and uh, but still want to try to affect change within our organizations. Um, Haben, can you give us maybe three takeaways from the ADA that we can go about in our daily lives and keep in mind and possibly reference when issues come up, um, just to help keep our corporate cultures and organizations on track? Thank you. So the ADA, is designed to be broad and involved with society and technology. It doesn't have specific guidelines on how exactly a school should teach a child or, or what tools or, or training a, a child re should receive. It, it basically says remove discrimination. The accommodations and tools should evolve with society and the resources available. If the school has resources to buy tech that would help your child or bring in a trainer to teach your child skill that, skills that would be useful, then the school must do so. There, there are exceptions for schools that absolutely don't have the resources if it's an undue burden, but I find many schools do have the resources but just don't want to. Um, it's. It is complicated. Another angle to keep in mind is disabled adults are an incredible resource for you and your child. It would be great if you could help find friends who have similar disabilities to connect with your son. They could be his age, they could be older, and a lot of skills. Uh, life strategies and self-advocacy skills can, can be shared that way. I learned a lot from joining blindness organizations and learning from the adults there. And that's how my self-advocacy journey began, learning about the ADA, that I had a right to advocate. I had to advocate as a kid. When I was very young, I didn't have the skills to advocate, and I missed out on a lot of opportunities. But as I grew up, high school, college, it became easier to advocate. And I started having more opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a combination of building community so you have more resources and gain more knowledge and maintaining pressure on the school to do as much as possible. Wonderful. Thank you, Haben. Where's our, do we have another question? 
Yeah. Hello, um, Anya Hamilton. Um, I'm the CHRO for Poly, um, a company we're making headsets and we're making collaboration equipment, video equipment, etc. And we are making a, a big push to a uh, very uh, highly remote and distributed workforce. And I actually just spent the whole day at our HR conference called Work Rebooted, where we talked about a lot of companies are moving to really enabling um, a more remote workforce to be able to connect to work remotely. So um, my question to the panel is, is um, would that, if companies were to embrace more of a remote or distributed workforce, would that help tap into the 10 million um, talent pool that's out there? And if it would, what advice do you have for companies to go and go about going um, remote and enabling more people to connect to the workplace this way? So, so I'd say I, th I think generally yes. Right? Um, I think we all have to look at where is the, the best way we can enable a workforce to, to, uh, um, to deliver against their, their potential, right? Um, you know, at Lenovo, we have a, we have a strong um, remote workforce, right? You know, actually, I'm, I'm up in Seattle. You know, um, our uh, chief uh, diversity officer is down in Austin. We have a big facility over in North Carolina. Our CEO is over in Beijing, right? So we, we really are di highly distributed. And um, it seems to work for us. As long as you can place in the, the right tools, the right processes to enable your workforce to be able to do their job, right? You know, um, it's very easy to have good synergies with other members of your workforce when you kind of meet them in, in the corridor or whatever the case it is. Um, so if you're, if you're taking that away to some degree, you have to make sure that you have the right tools to allow, you know, high, even more collaboration, right? right. Um, if, if you don't put that f uh, fundamental uh, technology in play, it makes it really difficult. And I don't know if it will work in that place. But for us, we, we really uh, invested in, in, the, in those tools. And that's all around kind of empowering our, our customer or our, our in employees. I think part of it too is is having the right conversations and the right data that you'll need to have internally mm -hmm. to show that the productivity and the profitability profitability can happen from home. I mean, mm -hmm. there's studies coming out now. I mean, it was all of the trend to make everything open workspaces and put folks in cubicles and take away offices. And now there's a bunch of stories coming out that that actually decreases productivity because of the noise and the distraction, and we mm -hmm. end up in social conversations instead of work, you know all of those things. Working from home, I think, is part of the future of work. Mm -hmm. There's a, a wonderful activist advocate you all should look up, a woman named Alice Wong, who really focuses on the voting rights and the disability block. But sh what she writes about most often is how much she accomplishes from her bed. Um, she was a White House champion of change. Um, there's a beautiful photo of her standing with Obama where it's um, essentially a robot with a video screen and mm -hmm. he's talking to her, big smile on his face, and she's sitting in her bed at home. There is technology that, are com that it's going to come from the companies in this room, that's going to come from companies like Lenovo that will change the future of work. And being open to your employees, being at home, in mm -hmm. increases your ability to bring the disability workforce into your company. That's excellent. Thank you. And we've got time for one more question. Hi, my name is Badri. Um, I'm a parent of a child with autism. And uh, the comments tonight have been great. And I really appreciate how you're looking at employers, how they should open up, think about inclusion. I appreciate the interviewees mm -hmm. thinking about how to uh, display their capabilities, explain them. But I want to go one step even back behind that. Mm -hmm. Do all so-called disabled people, have they unlocked their abilities? Do they know what they can do? Because on a personal level, I would love it if someone, whether a tool, program, person, mm -hmm. could unlock the abilities in my child <laughs> or identify them. So if we s slip out of my personal situation, just societally, are there programs or mechanisms to help people identify what those talents are? Haben, excellent. Yeah, I was gonna say, Haben, maybe we could get your thoughts first. In terms of when I think about autism, the first thing that comes up for me is the Autism Self-Advocacy Network, mm -hmm. which is a group of advocates, uh, lawyers and non-lawyers, who help train and educate and sometimes use litigation to increase opportunities for individuals uh, with autism. In when 
when I was applying for work, assumptions were the biggest barriers. People assuming that I can't, couldn't do jobs or, or not asking questions about my disability. What I found eventually is when I initiate the conversations about disability and say, these are my challenges, this is my disability, and these are the tools that I use, those interviews went much, much better. And there's training and education that can happen to help an individual build up those skills so they could say, Here's, here are the tools that I use. This is what I need from you. And, and to find the employers who are open to learning and recognize these talents and can create offices where these employees can thrive. There, there aren't enough of those employers, but we hope to, to grow those numbers and increase job opportunities. Excellent. I know we're running out of time, and it's been a really fantastic conversation. Um, before we pass to Karen for some closing remarks, um, I'd love just closing thoughts from our panelists um, about our conversation today. Um, and, and I'll start. I mean, one of the things that just really was reinforced and struck me as we talked was just the power within this room. And none of us individually, as our companies individually, are probably going to come to the right answers. And so there's just such a collective power mm -hmm. and opportunity um, across this room, across our companies, across our organizations, to really work together to make sure that we are really, um, you know, driving and in, um, inclusion for persons with disabilities. And so um, that's sort of my challenge for each of us today is to, to think outside of our own organizations and our own companies and find ways to continue to partner together to, to make progress. Crosby. Closing thoughts. Any closing thoughts <laughs> from you? Um, yeah, a couple. I don't, it got mentioned, but really, uh, as a starting tool in your companies, Accenture's Getting to Equal study on disability is an amazing tool with, with data that can be used for opening conversations. Thanks. It's something absolutely to look up and utilize. Flexibility uses it in a lot of our conversations, but just kind of thoughts um, for the companies in the room. I hope that you have and try, just be okay with trying mm -hmm. and failing. Mm -hmm. And knowing that there are safe spaces to try and to fail, you can create partnerships like Haben has with Lenovo or like Flexibility Builds with with our clients, we, we're going to allow you a safe space to try mm -hmm. and figure this out wherever you are on your journey. And then the last thing is just employ. Employ and empower. You're about to have a talent pool that will change your company for the better. That's good. Excellent. That's good. Haben, any closing thoughts from you? My closing remarks, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, employment is really, really important for all of us because I, I, I remember when I was younger being told that 70% of blind people face unemployment. And because I'm both deaf and blind, the odds for me would be much, much higher. So I first turned to litigation to try to deal with that. And I entered Harvard Law School wanting to develop the skills to be able to remove barriers through litigation. After law school, I worked at a law firm for about three years using litigation to remove barriers. And I noticed that one of the big problems was culture and people assuming that disability would never touch them, even though our bodies change as we age and disability touches every single group. It's part of the life cycle. Mm -hmm. And if you make your workplaces accessible and your products accessible, then you'll still be able to use them even as you age and your body changes. So it benefits all of us. And if we had a culture that taught people this and made accessibility part of the DNA of the organization, then we would have more access to all our tech and services, which would mean more job opportunities mm -hmm. and reduce the inequality that still exists for the disabled 30 years after the ADA. Mm -hmm. So I hope everyone will go back to their organizations and work on the culture, work on increasing access for everyone involved and your future selves. Mm -hmm. 
so you don't get sued. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Paul, I don't know how you wrap up after yeah. that, but, but <laughs> closing remarks. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I want to say, first of all, thank you to for you all for just yeah. coming out tonight and being a part of this. I think the, the big thing here is also to, look, there's a lot of you here, share cards, share whatever, but yeah. um, stay in contact with each other because I think it, the partnership that you can gain here mm -hmm. and then bring each other into each other's organizations mm -hmm. to really help. Um, talk about or, uh, or at least solicit some feedback and then talk about to, to your partners what you could be doing and, and how, it could be, how it could be done. Read Haben's book, mm -hmm. it's amazing. It'll step you through so much, that you have so many of the questions that you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, but look, it, we're, we're all in this together. We're all, we all know we wanna drive the right to, in the right direction. We gotta hire as many uh, disability uh, members of our teams as we, as we possibly can. It's really important to, to think, about, think about that. Put measurements around it and see how successful mm -hmm. that you are doing and where you're failing and then and just improve year by year. But I wanna say thank you to everybody. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your insights, your very candid comments. We really appreciate it so much. I'd like to roll a couple of quick credits here. This would not have been possible without the support of Lenovo. We want to give a special nod to Tarad, Neptune, and Paul as well. Crosby helped, Melissa helped, and the amazing Zeno group uh, with Todd Irwin, Stephanie Erickson, Rachel Mahoka, and Barbie Siegels here. Thank you so much. Uh, Lenovo has actually provided for the copy of Haben's book out there. If you haven't picked one up already, please do so. Uh, and finally, the uh, video of this program will be available very soon on our YouTube channel. We hope that you will share it widely mm -hmm. uh, and that you will find that to be a useful resource in general. And I also want to thank the Churchill team, Metro, our speaker, coach, and residence, Dennis Sakamoto. Thank you. Let's go make a difference. Good night. Thank you.